Hi, everybody. I'm Jim Kirkhoff with the Norman Studios Silent Film Museum located in Jacksonville, Florida. And welcome to our second Niles SNA Norman Studios virtual event, Mr. Gill in Jacksonville. Today, I'll be talking with historian Sam Gill from the Niles SNA Silent Film Museum in Fremont, California, about his on site research into early Jacksonville filmmaking. And when I say early, I mean early, over 100 years ago early. From 1908 to 1917, Jacksonville was known as the winter film capital of the world. In fact, the city's motion picture legacy even predates that of Hollywood. So how did that happen? Well, as most of you know, early filmmaking was initially centered around New York and New Jersey. But winters in the Northeast made shooting outdoors very problematic, if not impossible. It was cold, snow was everywhere, and the extreme temperatures caused all kinds of problems with camera mechanisms and film stock. At that time, a direct railroad line built by industrialist Henry Flagler operated from the Northeast down to the Jacksonville and St. Augustine area. The rail line was initially used by wealthy Northerners to escape the winter cold, but then early studio executives came up with a great idea. They said, why don't we just shoot films down in Jacksonville during the winter months? And that's exactly what they did. It was in 1908 that Calum set up Jacksonville's first permanent studio, and then others followed, including Lubin, Thanhauser, Vim, Gamont, Vitagraph, and the list goes on. And what's now known as Norman Studios was built by the Eagle Film Company after permanently relocating its operations from Chicago. Some of the performers who were part of the city's early film scene included Oliver Babe Hardy, Rosemary Thebe, and partner Harry Myers, Victor Moore, Louise Carver, Billy Bletcher, Walter Hires, Hilliard Carr, Walter Stahl and Bobby Burns, Kate Price, and that's just to name a few. By 1916, there were some 30 production companies with operations based around the city. But by 1918, many of these studios closed up shop and they left town. So what the heck happened? Well, a lot of film folks created quite a bit of commotion for the sake of their art. So they didn't exactly endear themselves to the good citizens of Jacksonville. For instance, if a scene was needed showing a fire truck racing out of the firehouse, they'd simply position a camera across the street and put in a false alarm. For comedies, they'd drive cars off of piers and into the St. John's River. Uh, now that kind of stunt didn't go over too well. And on Sundays, while most city residents were in worship services, film crews would take to the streets and use them as their own back lots for filming. But in the eyes of Jacksonville's church going public, you simply didn't work on Sundays. So Jacksonville voted out its mayor who supported building up the city's motion picture business and voted in a new mayor who vowed to get rid of these rowdy outsiders. And that's exactly what he did. Business incentives were eliminated, city cooperation ceased, and local banks stopped financing their productions. But by 1918, Los Angeles had firmly established itself as a center for film production on the West Coast, so the motion picture folks simply packed their bags and left for Hollywood. A lot more information about this facet of Jacksonville's history can be found on the Norman Studios website at normanstudios.org. Now, production facilities built in Jacksonville during that time have long since disappeared, except for one. The Norman Studios, which during the city's heyday of motion picture production, was known as Eagle Film City. It was there comedian Marcel Perez appeared in a variety of short comedies. We'll be talking about that a little later. I'll also be taking you on a tour of some Jacksonville filming locations I've uncovered since recently moving to the area. But now I'd like to turn it over to film historian and my friend, Sam Gill. Sam's going to talk about his hands-on research into Jacksonville's unique place in motion picture history, research he conducted a half century ago 
when little was known about this fascinating aspect of the city's heritage. Sam, to start off, can you tell us about the trip you made to Jacksonville back in 1974? Jim, it's a real... Uh delight for me to be here. I'm speaking from the Niles SNA Silent Film Museum, which is located in Niles, California, which is one of five districts of Fremont. If you're trying to find us on a map, look for Fremont, and Niles is part of the old town of Fremont, real old, 1860s on. Jacksonville is something that I had, uh, I'm not sure when I first ever heard about it. I had known a little bit about Edison and Edison loving Fort Myers, uh, Florida, and also then Lubin, and I had read about how Lubin loved Florida too and wanted to make films there. Uh, I was, a, I think in high school, a high school student, I was helping my mother with her genealogical research, and the best sources for genealogical work in Kansas was at, and still is, in Topeka, Kansas, which is the capital so I wondered what I could find about old film because I loved the whole concept of silent film and what it was, and I wanted to learn everything I could about it. And unbelievably, they had a reference book from the teens era called the Motion Picture News Studio Directory, which was actually a trade directory that listed virtually everyone working in the motion picture industry as of that time. And so I started to look through it, making notes, hundreds and hundreds of people. I kept seeing addresses, not just New York City or Bayonne, New Jersey, or Los Angeles, or even Hollywood. It'd be Jacksonville, Florida, Jacksonville, Florida, Jacksonville, Florida. And I thought, what the heck is this Jacksonville, Florida stuff? And I put together a list when I was a teenager is my first list, and, uh, and then John McCabe's Laurel and Hardy book came out, and he interviewed Oliver Hardy as well as Stan Laurel and talked about Babe Hardy's really start in the movies in Jacksonville. In college, I had access to uh, marvelous resources at the University of Kansas, and then uh, I decided in 1965 in the winter that I was going to go to Hollywood in 1966, which I did. And I went there because I wanted to interview everyone still alive who had worked in the silent era and who could tell me their stories, you know, because it had been about 50 years before. I realized, though, that there are these other stories that hadn't been told, and one of them is Jacksonville, Florida. I had uh, my time in the Army. I needed to, to serve in the Army, which I did three years. And then once I, uh, near the end of that time, I thought, boy, I'd like to go to Jacksonville because I was stationed at Fort Bragg, which is in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and I fell in love with the South and Southerners. I just had wonderful personal experiences, and I had been to Florida through the Third Army Soldier Show and loved what I saw. I thought, well, as soon as I can, I'm going to Jacksonville. But it wasn't really until 1973 in the winter I was living in southern Missouri, and I thought, well, it's either now or never, Sam, because I knew I needed to get back to Los Angeles and my work there. I decided, I don't care what it takes, I'm going to do it. I didn't have any money, however. <laughs> so I had to figure out how, you know, where I could scrape together enough money to go. And I had a little uh, Ford Maverick, yellow Ford Maverick that I took. And I drove from Southern Missouri to Jacksonville, Florida without knowing anybody there. And I didn't have a bank account there either. I hadn't thought about that. So when I tried to cash a check, no, no bank would <laughs> take it. So I asked uh, Miss Dina Snodgrass, who is a wonderful historian for Jacksonville, what do I do in a case like this? And she said, oh, go to Traveler's Aid, which I did. And they said, oh, we'll cash it for you, which is unbelievable that they did that, gave me enough money. And they even said where I might find a room to live, which turned out to be the Mikesels, of whom I'm sure many people in Jacksonville will remember, Mr. and Mrs. Mikesell. And uh, they had a wonderful little apartment that was up on the second floor in the corner where you had windows on either side. And it was like, paradise. The only thing of it is, is I didn't really have any money. 
But I thought, well, I have enough money for the end of the month, so let's get going. And I got to start my research there uh, at that time. And I had tons of research. So I had one of those big old cases, you know, it was absolutely crammed full with research. Because I thought, well, I better know the names of every person that ever worked here if I can find out what they are. But once I got to Jack Smells, you might guess I found hundreds of more people. Anyway, Jim, that's kind of 10 times more than you meant for me to answer, I'm sure. But it kind of gives everyone an idea of why was I, you know, going to the trouble to go to Jacksonville, Florida. That took a lot of guts to just hop in your car and go cross country to Jacksonville, Sam. Uh, I understand you uncovered a lot of information about Calum, uh, which was Jacksonville's very first film studio. Can you talk about their arrival in the city back in 1908? Calum was a company that always fascinated me. And uh, it was founded by uh, KLM that's kind of similar to it. SNA, which was S for Spoor and A for Anderson, George K. Spoor and uh, GM Anderson or Bronco Billy. Calum was also three initials too, K, L, and M, which made Calum. And that was uh, George Kleine and Samuel Long and Francis J. Marion or Frank J. Marion. So they were kind of this triumvirate and uh, formed their own company and was one of the really pioneering and important early companies. Jacksonville was a natural place because it had such good access by the sea and by train and automobile, everything. It was very accessible. Uh, and it was a, you know, only a certain number of hours away from New York. They were always thinking, well, how far is it from New York? <laughs> so uh, they decided to check that out. They find a perfect place, which was an area called Pleasant View. And boy, was Pleasant View named well. And so they talked to a woman by the name of Nellie Dentz and also a woman by the name of Ma Perkins. Ma Perkins was the one that operated, owned and operated and managed the Hotel Roseland, which was very, which was really more a boarding house than a hotel. And so a lot of the people staying there were uh, entertainment people <laughs> because a lot of other boarding houses didn't want to put up them. And the reason they didn't is that they had a bad habit of skipping town without paying their bills. So Ma Perkins was so beloved that uh, I guess if someone tried to skip out on town, they better have someone to answer to for having done that. So she, Ma Perkins was, and she was called, oh, a very stern, difficult person. Well, she had to be, I think. Nellie Dentz was a different kind of personality, but she had a beautiful home that uh, the very quickly the Kalem people realized uh, would be a, an ideal spot for a studio right next to it. There was room at Hotel Roseland too, but for, for whatever reason, they uh, chose Nellie Dentz's property. And that does get very confused by film historians, some Jacksonville film historians, is that they sometimes will show a picture of the Hotel Roseland, and that's fine, but sometimes they'll show a picture of the Kalem house, and it's uh, labeled Hotel Roseland, which it isn't. <laughs> now, what's wonderful when you think about Calum House is that you had all the key people were living in there, and but it was, you know, 1909 and 10 and 11, and at that time, uh, no one even knew who the players were by name, but Calum was one of the first companies to actually develop the concept of a stock company and to give names to the people who were appearing in their films. And for those of you who know film history, that was a radical concept because a lot of the old time producers had been, come from the theater and they knew as soon as you give a lot of attention to someone, they're gonna want more money. <laughs> so the film producers thought, well, we're not gonna let that happen, you know? So they waited for years like Biograph, I think it wasn't until 1913 or 14, they finally started to say who the people were in their films. Calum actually made an easel that fumed oak easel, 
that was like an A-frame, and they actually had pictures of their stock company on either side to advertise that these are the people you're seeing in our films, and you'll come to love those people. And sure enough, public did, and they started to uh, find out what were their names and attach their names to the films that they were in. So you have people like Anna Q. Nielsen, a marvelous star in later films, but she pretty much got her start at Calum in major roles. And then uh, Jean Gaunty, I should mention, was the one that really kind of blazed the trail. And in fact, she wrote her own autobiography called Blazing the Trail. <laughs> and uh, that came out in the Woman's Home Companion, I believe, that serialized. And that was an amazing story. She sort of was, for, for the first time, telling the story of Jacksonville. Uh, now, the irony was I never could find a copy of that damn thing. <laughs> And so here I am in Jacksonville with my ton of research. I'm going like, probably the one most important thing I really need is Jean Gonte is blazing it. But in those days, trying to find rare books or even rarer magazines like the Woman's Home Companion, no, no library had those. They were considered too fluff or something. I don't know, but I never could find them. But Tom Moore uh, was down there and Alice Joyce, who later was a famous actress, and uh, Tom Moore and Alice Joyce fell in love there and got married. And one of the things I very quickly started to do was to go to the county and city archives. And at those times, they had everything in hard copy. And I mean, the volumes were like these massive volumes. And I looked for lease agreements, hoping that maybe I could find some of those. And I actually found the lease agreement with Nellie Dance and Calum Company, believe it or not, 1911 to 12, and then extended 1912 to 13, and 1913 to 14, and the actual lease agreement signed <laughs> were in the Duval County uh, records. That paid off big, and then also I thought, oh, marriage license. <laughs> so there were marriage licenses kept in the same volumes, but large volumes. And I started to look through those, and guess what? Alice Joyce and Tom Moore and their marriage license. And in fact, it was actually uh, witnessing the marriage. It was more than the license. Uh, James C. Craig was a reporter for the Florida Times Union in the 1940s. But he became fascinated by the idea of all these people who in Jacksonville still at that time in the 40s had worked for the movie studio. He tracked down every person he could to get their story. And then he recounted in detail in two extremely large uh, editorial pieces for the Florida Times Union in 1949. Every studio that he could determine ever went to Jacksonville and made movies there. So I look him up, he's in the phone book. One of the people he mentioned was uh, Mrs. Brady A. James, and he's, I think she's still around. So as soon as I could, I looked at the phone book, and there it is, Brady A. James. And I thought, oh my God. So I call her, and that was probably the single greatest discovery I made in Jacksonville. Turns out, that Mrs. Brady A. James was the daughter of the housekeeper for the Calum house. <laughs> and so she grew up with all of the Calum people. And so they were literally her childhood friends. She was younger, about the same age actually, a little younger than some of them, but so she could go on and on about Anna Q. Nielsen. Oh yes, and Tom Moore, and Guy Coombs. She said, oh, he was in love with Anna Q. and would bring straw wild strawberries. He'd go strawberry picking and then come back to the house and we'd all have strawberries, you know, and cream and all that. And we had a piano and they'd play the piano and we'd all sing. And I said, you mean Tom Moore, and Alice Joyce, Anna Q. Nielsen, Guy Coombs? And, Sidney Oldcott and the director, Robert Vignola, Sidney Oldcott, Keenan Buell. I said, she said, yeah, they were all there. And I thought, well, you got to tell me more. <laughs> so she opened up and had a phenomenal recall also. 
And at one point even I said, well, can you take me to where it was? I want to see it. Well, that was an eye opener because as you might guess, Jacksonville did not stand still from 1908 to 1974 when I was there. And so very little of it really survived. The Norman Studios did, but I was more interested in the Eagle Company, and I couldn't find anyone who had worked for Eagle. One of the things that I did also that uh, you can now benefit from through the Florida Memory Project, which is an online digital uh, program of like 50, 60,000 images, anything that I found of unusual interest or historical interest about Jacksonville, I made an arrangement at the time in 1974 that anything I was finding, if uh, they were willing to pay for a decent photographic copy of it, that I would give uh, one whole set of these to the Florida State Photographic Archives. And that was Joan Morris was the woman who was in charge of that. And her husband, Alan Morris, was involved, of course, with the government there in Tallahassee. So uh, I mention that because uh, film historians sometimes forget about the importance of the photographic image. Sam, in addition to Calum, there were a lot of other studios with permanent operations in Jacksonville. Can you talk about some of that? What quickly happened, I noticed, an article that was written about my research by a, a wonderful reporter there, I think his name was, name was Lloyd Brown, he asked if he could uh, meet with me and have his photographer along, and, and he said, I'd like to tell the story of what you're doing here, why you're here in Jacksonville, and it's fascinating. I explained what I was doing and uh, went into a fair amount of detail, and I thought, oh, well, you know, that was nice. Well, what I didn't know is I was, a, now I'm a celebrity, because everyone in town read that newspaper. <laughs> and when I went to the library, they were all like, Sam Gill, Sam Gill, yeah. And I go, well, that had never happened before. So I get a phone call out of nowhere. Hello, my name is Sidney J. Vaughn, and I read the article in the paper, and I wanted to let you know that I was uh, there at the time. He says, well, you know, I was uh, born and raised there in Jacksonville. I, I had a job at the time, but uh, I got wind of the fact that the Edison Company from New Jersey, New York and New Jersey, uh, wanted to make some films in Jacksonville, and would I help them do that? And I, I certainly would be happy to, and the person I worked for was C.J. Williams. Well, this opened up a whole nother world, and in answer to your question, why I kind of went from Calum to Edison all of a sudden, overnight almost, is now I have a man who had worked for the Edison Company, and I wanted to know everything I could possibly determine from him about Edison, because I wasn't aware of anyone ever writing about Edison at Jacksonville. I said, where, were, where was the Edison Company at that time? And he says, Dixieland Park. Well, that, for people who love Jacksonville history, that opens up a whole nother universe of history, and that is Dixieland Park, which by pictures, when I would look at pictures, I can't tell you how I wanted to be a little child again and go to Dixieland Park <laughs> and see all the animals and the clowns. and the, It was virtually kind of a circus, carnival, uh, amusement park, dance hall, everything. It, it was just phenomenal. And so I was interested in that. And he said, oh, I can talk all about that too. And I go, oh my God. And so, but what that led to is he said, now what happened is Edison decided they were gonna go back north and close out their little studio. And he said, I said, where was the studio? And he says, it was in the Park Theater, which is sometimes called Dixie uh, Theater or Dixie Park Theater or Dixie Land. Park Theater, whatever, but it's the same building, and uh, it was gone. It was torn down in 1964. So he says, well, what happened was 
uh, Gaumont, which was the French company, had were making films in New York, but they had heard and seen the films that were being made in Jacksonville and thought this would be really good. And so a gentleman by the name of Richard Garrick, who many of you may remember was in many films later and had such a beautiful voice. He was literally a voice coach in silent films. <laughs> but anyway, he was a, a man from the stage and made many sound films later. Richard Garrick uh, is the one, is the contact, and he goes to Jacksonville, and who should he meet but Sidney J. Vaughn. So I say, you mean you met Richard Garrick? Oh yeah, I became his office manager. And uh, that's like, okay, Gaumont. So now I had, uh, I'm leading from Caleb to Edison to Gaumont, and I thought this is incredible. And then he was talking about things, and one of the things was, he said, now I was dating a girl though at Calum. I remember that, uh, oh, lovely girl. And I said, what was her name? And he said, Ruth Snow. And I said, Ruth Snow James? And he says, well, Ruth Snow, her mother ran the, the Calum house. And I said, you dated her? And he said, yes. I don't know what became of her. And I said, well, I just talked with her last week. <laughs> and would, I said, would you like to meet her? And I thought, I'm going to be able to bring two people back together who had to see each other for 50 more, 60 years. And uh, I did. That was quite an experience, too. And the reason I say that's an experience, and it in part answers something that, Jim, you'd be interested in. There was terrific rivalry between the companies. And so when I got the two of them together, they wouldn't let me record it, unfortunately. But as soon as... Uh, I went home, I of course wrote everything down. But they got into arguments because uh, their, the films that Gaumont made and the films that Calum made were very different kinds of film and they had their different target audiences. Calum was especially popular among the Southerners and the rebels because they made Civil War films from the Southern perspective. And by doing that, uh, they had great success throughout the movie houses throughout the South. Uh, not so much in the North, but great in the South. And uh, so he was kidding her about that. He says, well, all those Civil War horse operas that you guys were making. She said, well, we were making films that people really wanted to see you instead of the Gaumont features. And he said, why, well, these were wonderful films we Gaumont was making. And she said, well, yeah, if you like society dramas and Williams, w women wearing gowns and you know necklaces and all that, but we had action pictures. <laughs> so I very quickly learned that, oh, well, I'm gonna have to be a little more attuned to the company that these people work with and for. I did find uh, the name of uh, a person that this led me to Gaumont also, and that was a Guy Coutant. And those of you who have seen the Mackey and Coutant film of the 1914 Confederate reunion in Jacksonville, Guy Coutant was the man who photographed, uh, along with all the key cinematographers from all of the companies, agreed that they would come to film these 40 thousand Civil War veterans who were still alive in 1914, who all came, it was the greatest encampment since the war in 1914. And so they had tent after tent after tent. And they, I mean, the Red Cross had to be there. Every, and so they, all the cameramen shot all this footage. And what I didn't know is that that footage survived, but it was in nitrate in the hands of a the oldest time projectionist in Jacksonville at that time in 1974. And when I got his name, I said, well, can I meet with you? Not knowing what I was gonna get into. Well, Guy Coutant also worked for the Gaumont companies, but for everybody in the newsreels as well. And so Bender Cawthon, the projectionist, he had a gold card from the projectionist union 50-year card. He started in 1922. For 50 years, he had been a projectionist in the theaters there. 
And he was a, a marvelous source and could give me a lot of the situation about what happened in the community. Why did the film companies get up and leave? And so uh, once we get into that, if we want to, uh, I can reveal some of the things that Mr. Cawthon also told me. Thanks, Sam. Both of us have always had a keen interest in silent film comedy, and Jacksonville was a center for the production of many early shorts. How about if we screen one of these made by Kayla? It's titled Peaches and Ponies, made in 1916, and features Ivy Close and Henry Murdoch. Afterwards, Sam will have some interesting information to share about its featured performers. The film we're about to screen comes to us courtesy of our friend Dave Glass over in Great Britain. With that, let's sit back and enjoy it.
Sam, your focus as a film historian has centered a lot around comedy. In fact, I remember Christmas 1970, getting a copy of the book you co-authored, Clown Princes and Court Gestures. So you're an expert on the subject. Can you talk about some of the comedy performers who started out in Jacksonville? While I was in uh, Jacksonville, uh, David Shepard, who was at that time uh, uh, one of the uh, major figures with Black Hawk Films, which was a film company making films for the collector's market, and he said, uh, I understand you know a lot about silent screen comedy and might be willing to write titles for Black Hawk films. Well, <laughs> I mean, I loved Black Hawk films and had read, I mean, when they had introductory titles, I'd get my dad's editing machine and write verbatim everything that that person had said about it. And it was introductory titles to each new film that they were releasing. And by new film, I mean old film. I thought, oh, well, what films do you have? And he says, well, I have some plump and runs. Well, Plump and Runt is Oliver Hardy and Billy Rouge who were making their films in Jacksonville. And I said, are you sure these are Plump and Runt? And he says, yeah, it says Plump and Runt, Vim comedy. I go, oh my God. Because I knew Vim was, had been making comedies at the f former Florida Yacht Club and around town and using every other kind of site they could find. Oliver Hardy fascinated me, and any, almost any time I would visit with someone, I'd say, do you remember Oliver Hardy or Billy Rouge? And people would go, oh, Billy Rouge, wasn't he kind of like that Joey Brown guy with the big mouth? And I'd say, well, like a miniature Joey Brown guy, because he's tiny. Uh, but yeah, Billy Rouge. The funny thing about Oliver Hardy, most of the people that I visited with said, well, I saw him in the movies, but I remember his singing more than I do his being on screen because he has such a beautiful voice. And I said, well, where would you hear him? And they, everyone said, oh, everywhere. It, he, had, he had a quartet. <laughs> he, he sang in nightclubs. He sang song slides for the theaters. He sang for the theaters, you know, just numbers, not just slides, but he'd get there. He had such a beautiful voice. And so every once in a while in his Laurel and Hardy films, you'll hear that beautiful voice. He had, he had a beautiful tenor voice. Walter Hires, I, I kept asking people about, they didn't seem to know, he had done a lot of work for all the companies, uh, including uh, just all of them, and a lot of minor companies. Uh, I, I was able to track down his collection later, which was at the University of Southern California, uh, which was given by his widow. Uh, but since he died in the 30s, you know, I wanted to know more, but no luck with that. I won't go into this, but when I went back to Hollywood, I did look up Billy Bletcher and talked with Billy Bletcher, who uh, is well known as a voice artist later for Disney and other companies. Uh, had a very, very deep voice. He was very short, but had an extremely deep voice. And so I was able to visit with him, and he l loved his years at Jacksonville. So that was a little bit in, uh, interesting to me, too, more about, well, you know, what more can you tell me? You know, so he told me some things as well, but that was in Hollywood. Uh, Bobby uh, Burns and uh, Walter Stoll, who were known as Burns and Stoll or Pokes and Jabs, Pokes and Jabs was a very good name for them because there was a, not quite Three Stooges, but you know, Pokes and Jabs. <laughs> so there was a lot of physicality Pokes and Jabs comedies. And one thing that some of us forget about is that back in the teens, there was just as much target audiences as there is today. Uh, Pokes and Jabs filled a real niche because they were very, very well-made, brief, one reels, usually, some two reels, but I think mostly one reelers, which meant a thousand feet of film, and very good little comedies. And they often were out on the streets of Jacksonville. There was one woman I met and she said, well, I was a bathing beauty in some of those films. And I said, oh, great, because there was a series called Sunbeam. And, and I said, were you in Sunbeam comedy? Said, I think that was what they were called, Sunset or sun, something. I said, probably Sunbeam. And she said, well, I remember it, I worked with Fatty Arbuckle on those. Well, 
I was not aware of Fatty Arbuckle making any films in Jacksonville. And I, I said, oh, really? Uh, I didn't want to put the kibosh on her stories. She said, I have a picture. And so she went into her bedroom, came out with a wonderful photograph of Hilliard Carr. <laughs> and Hilliard Carr, for those of you who have, have really low tastes and like the ton of fun, the three fatties, in their films, which was Hilliard Carr, Cupy Ross, and Frank Alexander, Fatty Alexander, and they were known as the three fatties in those days. You wouldn't call them that today, but the ton of fun. And so I thought, my God, this is a terrific shot of Hilliard Carr. So can I borrow this? I'd like to copy this. But I didn't have the heart to tell her it's not fa Fatty Arbuckle. I didn't see what the point would be after all those years and her telling probably all her friends and everything, and they go, oh, wow. And after all, he was built kind of like Roscoe Arbuckle. Uh, Saint, actually, Walter Hires is sometimes mistaken also. And they'll say, oh, look, Fatty Arbuckle, and it's Walter Hires. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Towards the end of Jacksonville's reign as winter film capital of the world, even the city's most prominent architect got into the act. Henry Clutho built what was then a state-of-the-art studio to attract motion picture companies. As I recall, Sunbeam comedies were shot there along with a number of Johnny Ray shorts. Sam, can you talk a bit about Clutho Studios and what happened to it? Yeah, Henry J. Clutho was one of the most interesting figures of... Uh, a person in Jacksonville history, actually in San Francisco history as well, because um, Jacksonville had had a horrible fire in 1901, which leveled uh, much of Jacksonville and had to be built again. Henry Clouseau had done a lot of uh, architectural work in San Francisco as well, with another um, you know, place that was basically by earthquake and fire, you know, totally destroyed. Caluso uh, was an architect and a highly, highly regarded architect, and he relocated to Jacksonville, where he stayed, as far as I know, his whole life was spent there. Now, what's interesting about Caluso is at the very time that the film people uh, being in Jacksonville became a contentious issue uh, among those running for mayor. You had J.E.T. Bowden, who people seem to often refer to him as Jet Bowden, <laughs> but it's actually J.E.T. is our initials of his name. And uh, the man who was running for mayor, and I won't even mention his name, but he was running against the film people. And it was a shock to a lot of those uh, people who had been located in Jacksonville and had spent a terrific amount of money and also you know, brought large numbers of people to the city who were spending money. And, and I should tell one fun, kind of funny little thing is I found a member of the family of the man who became mayor. It was a daughter. <laughs> and uh, I uh, said, I'd like to know your take on the film people in here in Jacksonville. And she said, oh, those people, oh, they are horrible. And I here's 1974, and she's telling me how horrible the film people were. And I thought, that gave me a real insight to the emotional reaction that people had to the film people. Yeah. Clutho was observing all this and not really approving of it. He thought that Jacksonville should be happy to have someone like Mayor Bowden, who was bringing a lot of business to the city. And uh, some of the buildings, the dial-up church building, I thought was especially beautiful, and that was uh, a Clutho building. And uh, as are many, many other architectural landmarks. Uh, what was interesting is that when uh, basically Jacksonville drove people out, it's very unfortunate for Jacksonville that it came to that conclusion. Uh, there were a couple of things that had happened. Uh, one of them was the uh, there was a film that was made and it needed a huge mob scene. And the city basically agreed to shut down and let everyone <laughs> join the mob. Uh, and that included all the kids in school. 
at all the different schools and included all the merchants, everyone. You could just lock up and be in the mob. And that mob turned uh, bad. It, it apparently did, it was a lot of damage. I mean, over a thousand people, you know, all of a sudden they're a mob mobbing this downtown. That was unfortunate that that happened right at the time when the companies were trying to maintain their balance. Sidney Vaughan, whom I mentioned earlier, who was the office manager for Golmont, I asked him, why, why did the Golmont leave? And he said, well, for a lot of reasons, which I've already related. But another one I didn't relate, and that he said, price gouging became rampant in Jacksonville. And somehow the word got out among the merchants, you can charge them anything, they've got to pay. I mean, he said the merchants just turned on the film people. Clutho had vision, though. He had already decided to build his own studio, and that was the one that had the Briggs comedies on it. And uh, it was a, what they call a rental studio. And by renting it out, uh, he did quite well with any company that came to Jacksonville, assuming that they could film there. Well, most of the places that uh, had the studios you weren't available anymore. So Clutho was very smart. He made it pretty much state of the art. I think he, there were several companies that could work at the same time on that large stage he had. He had dressing rooms and he had you know, carpenter shops and everything else that you could want. So Clutho was brilliant. Oh, and I should mention like uh, the Briggs company that was at Clutho. You might think, well, what, that name Briggs is familiar. Well, it was uh, Clara Briggs, who was a famous cartoonist, and he's the one that devised the when a feller needs a friend. And a Skinny uh, was kind of the main character, and that was extremely popular. And for a while, uh, James Montgomery Flagg and uh, Claire Briggs rented the Clutho Studios for cartoon-like comedies. And I don't know if any of them survive. So I know Steve Massa, if any of them survive, please tell Steve Massa and he'll be jumping up and down. Okay, now let's take a look at sites around Jacksonville where some of these early films were shot. As many of you know, Oliver Hardy began his career as a motion picture comedian here in Jacksonville. Here's a publicity photo taken of Hardy with his Vim co-star Kate Price. In John McCabe's book, Babe, The Life of Oliver Hardy, the building behind them is identified as being the Vim Comedy Company office on Riverside Drive. Well, with the help of Jacksonville historian Wayne Wood, I've been able to confirm that although the photo was taken on Riverside Drive, it's not the Vim offices. Instead, it's the Champlin Mansion, just a few blocks from where Vim was located. So let's take a look at what this site looks like today. Gone. Oh well, this spot of Riverside Drive is now occupied by the headquarters of Florida Blue Cross and Blue Shield. So that begs the question, exactly where was the VIM studio located? Well, it was right next to another mansion owned by the Cummer family. Today, the Cummer Museum of Art and Gardens sits where the mansion once stood. That's the museum on the lower right portion of this photo. In the upper left, under the north end of the Fuller Warren Bridge of Interstate 95, is where the Vim Comedy Company did its work. The studio property was once the Jacksonville Yacht Club, located at 740 through 750 Riverside Drive. That's before the club decided to sell its land and buildings to the Lubin Film Company, which became the occupant before Vim. I'll bet the wealthy Cummer family was simply overjoyed to have a bunch of wild motion picture folks as their neighbor. Here's what the bridge underpass looks like today. And here's what it looked like in Lubin's A Servant Girl's Legacy back in 1914. That's Babe Hardy with the St. John's River in the background. A Lucky Strike was another Lubin comedy featuring Babe Hardy. In this film, he imagines himself as a successful husband and father living a comfortable life in a very nice home. 
Well, that home is still standing, and here's what it looks like today. It's in Riverside at the corner of College and Goodwin Streets, just a couple of blocks from Riverside Park. Now, here's a frame grab from Lubin's 1915 comedy, An Expensive Visit. It shows Raymond McKee in drag talking with Ed Lawrence, who plays Hardy's father in the film. You'll notice they're standing on a very straight sidewalk. Well, that sidewalk still accommodates a lot of pedestrians today, since it's the main entrance into Riverside Park. Vim's 1916 The Serenade was shot mostly outdoors on the streets of Riverside. Here's one street corner location where Babe Hardy and Billy Bletcher exchange words. The corner is still there at Riverside Drive and Osceola Street. The large white home down the street is still there, just hidden behind shrubs in this photo. Even the original stone fence and some sidewalk pavers are still in place. After Vim, Babe Hardy appeared in a number of Billy West King Bee comedies shot in Jacksonville, including this one, The Villain. Here we see Hardy dressed in drag while being charmed by the loathsome Mr. West from this 1917 two-railer. The body of water this scene was shot on is the Ortega River, not far from where it feeds into the St. Johns River. I've determined that this film was filmed at Jacksonville's Stinson Park with the location looking very much as it did more than 100 years ago. And next to Stinson Park is the Ortega Bridge. Today, it's a cement drawbridge that was built in 1926. But when the villain was shot in 1917, it was a wooden bridge that carried a trolley line across it along with cars and horse-drawn wagons. Here's a postcard of what the Ortega Bridge looked like back then. So how about if we now turn our attention to Marcel Perez and some Jacksonville locations where he shot scenes for his Eagle comedies. Here's a frame grab from A Busy Night where Perez gets a bit tipsy at a private men's club and ends up on the street outside trying to hail a cab. Notice the distinct architectural features of the building behind him. Well, that structure still stands in downtown Jacksonville, looking almost exactly like it did back then. It's now an office building, but back in those days, it was the Morocco Temple, which was designed by architect Henry Clouseau. Like the Norman Studios, this structure is on the National Register of Historic Places, which protects it from future development. Another scene in this 1916 comedy has Perez dropping onto a beach where he meets a cave woman, played by himself, who's sitting on the dune. Now, don't ask me why. My thinking is the scene was shot at Atlantic Beach since it was the closest stretch of sand to the Eagle Film Studio. Back then, this section of beach could be easily accessed by Atlantic Boulevard, which ended right here at the ocean. And how about this scene from A Busy Night? Take a good look at the building behind Marcel Perez. Well, it's the main production building of the Eagle Film Company, which not long afterwards became Norman Studios. Here's what the building looks like today, located at 6337 Arlington Road in Jacksonville. It's this structure that houses the Norman Studios Silent Film Museum. Another view of the building can be seen in Perez's Some Hero, along with the studio swimming pool, which Perez is about to dive into head first. Now that's Arlington Road in the background. Here's what that view looks like today. As you can see, the pool is long gone, now buried underground. Turning around 180 degrees, you can see what served as a studio stage set building. I'm showing you this because just behind it is where indoor sets were constructed outdoors under a muslin tarp to help diffuse the strong Florida sun. Here's a supposedly interior scene from Lend Me Your Wife, which was shot here. When watching this film, the curtains and tablecloth blow in a very strong wind, which is a dead giveaway that this interior was actually filmed outside. 
The last still frame I'm going to show you is from a scrambled honeymoon featuring a scene that was shot in Riverside Park. Here's Marcel Perez saving his future bride while her mother, the lovely Louise Carver, flounders in the treacherous waters of the Riverside Pond. Based on views of the pond in vintage postcards, I've been able to pinpoint the exact spot where Perez's bench was positioned in the park. It's on the left, right where the couple is strolling. And here's that spot today. Going one step further, looking at the direction of their shadows in the film, I've been able to figure out that the scene was shot during the evening hours rather than in the early morning golden light for whatever that's worth. Just for kicks, here's a frame grab showing Marcel Perez to the rescue. And here's that same area of the Riverside Park Pond today. So there you have it. Now that I'm living in Jacksonville, I'm really looking forward to doing more research into historical filming locations that are around this great city. And I intend to find them. With that, let me now turn it back over to Sam. One thing that my studies in Jacksonville uh, further convinced me is not only of the importance of the time that the film studios were in Jacksonville, and I hadn't mentioned Glenn Lambert, too, who was uh, the, a, a, a great source for filmmaking a little bit after most of the companies had left. He was there at the same time, Glenn Lambert, and he loved Florida. He went to uh, New York, he went to Hollywood, he worked with Roscoe Arbuckle, lots of great comedians and uh, other studios. But he had a fondness for Florida that never left him, and uh, he retired, or lived there, and then retired there, and guess what? He died just months before I made my trip to Jacksonville. And so I can't tell you how many people uh, in 1974, when I would ask them questions, they go, oh boy, I don't know, but Glenn Lambert sure would have known that. And just once again, for if, if there's anyone out there in the ether and you think that maybe you should do something that's time sensitive for whatever reason, do it. Uh, there's a couple of other things I became convinced about, and that is that uh, more and more, when I was doing research, I discovered the most unlikely places <laughs> that would have a little film industry for a while. And I mean all over the country. I, I'm not sure there would be a single state in the Union, and as Hawaii and Alaska as well, where there wasn't some filmmaking going on. And so I think my parting words would be, based upon my own experience, Check out your own state or your own localities or your own cities for whatever history they, there might be there. Because later, as I worked for, as an archivist for the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, I would often have people like from Arizona saying, well, I'm here studying such and such a company. And I'd say, well, have you thought about studying Lubin? Because they were in Arizona. They were? Are you sure? <laughs> I say, they sure were. If anyone says, well, you know, you're kind of like living in the past, aren't you? I always had a good answer for that. And that is, no, I explore the past. So I explore it just like a paleontologist or osteologist or anyone is studying something that you dig up out of the ground. Well, they're film and film people. That's what I do. So. If anyone says you're living in the past, just tell them, no, you're exploring the past, and then move on. I think that's it. <laughs> Very quickly, our next Niles SNA Norman Studios virtual event will include information about the Thanhauser Company and its Jacksonville studio. This will be a presentation by film historian and family member Ned Thanhauser. And it will also include a couple of very rare Thanhauser films that were made here. We also have other events planned in the future that include Ben Modell and Steve Massa talking about Eagle Film City and the comedies created there. Ben's Undercrank Productions has restored many of the Perez shorts, including several made here in Jacksonville. And Steve is the author of Marcel Perez, The International Mirthmaker, and he's a highly respected film historian. 
Another program will feature Rob Stone, author of Laurel or Hardy, and Pokes and Jabs, the before, during, and after of the Vim Films Corporation, talking about Babe Hardy's early years at Lubin, Vim, and King B. Rob will be joined by Serge Bromberg of Lobster Films, which restored a number of Hardy's Jacksonville comedies and are included on its Laurel or Hardy Blu-ray set. So be on the lookout. And remember to visit our two websites for more information about silent film history and Jacksonville's early role in the motion picture industry. We're going to leave you with a photo I shot from a rooftop of the sun setting over the Riverside section of Jacksonville where so much film history was made. Until next time, thanks for joining us.